Welcome to Washington Policy Center, Washington Policy on the Go. My name is David Bose. I'm the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center. Today, uh, usually we have center directors on um, to talk about our issues. Today's a special event in that for the first time, I think we have a special guest from the Building Industry Association of Washington, Jan Heimbaugh, will be uh, joining us to talk about uh, HB 1589, and the um, the effort to ban natural gas. Uh, we'll be speaking with her in just a moment. We'll also speak with Patrick Hanks. He's a WPC project coordinator for our Center for the Environment and works with Todd. So we'll be talking about those things. Um, while we wait for people to be able to join us here for just a couple of minutes, I want to remind you the legislative session only has a few days left, scheduled to end on Thursday. This is one of the last major bills that the legislature is dealing with outside of budget uh, budget bills. Um, it will deal with some uh, pretty significant issues, especially if you're a user of natural gas. And uh, and I think you'll, you'll be shocked at how, um, how big of an impact this particular piece of legislation could have. So we'll be talking about that. Plus, I want to remind you that uh, this is an interactive uh, meeting. So if you have a a question at any time, just use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, enter that question in, and we will try and get to it. Uh, I'll try and incorporate it into our conversation, but you can enter that question at any time, and we'll try and get to it. If we can't get to it this session, um, we do try and answer them on an individual basis. But if for any reason you don't get that question answered and you're not hearing from us, uh, just remember that all of our staff has their direct email on our staff page at WashingtonPolicy.org, and are happy to respond to your questions. So you can email it direct as well if you have any any problems there. Um, so with that said, I want to uh, I want to bring on Jen Heimbaugh with the Building Industry Association of Washington and Patrick Hanks. Um, uh, Jen, uh, HB 1589 has gotten a lot of attention in part because. There were uh, there were certain rules broken when it was uh, when it was being drafted. This led to all kinds of confusion um, on the floor, and a, a a redrafting, you know, a recess, then a redrafting, and then a need to redraft the redraft that passed. So there's been some craziness going on. Why don't you kind of walk us through, uh, first of all, what the bill does, what it is, and and what some of the problems have been. Yeah, thanks, Dave. It's good to be here, um, and I'm sorry for everybody. I'm at the Capitol right now. So there might be some background noise. My phone is going to wave around uh, a little bit. So it's hard to hold it steady. But um, House Bill 1589 is a bill from last year that is still alive. In essence, it fundamentally bans natural gas for Puget Sound Energy customers, which is, you know, about 812,000 residential customers. I don't know what their commercial or manufacturing customer base is. But what it does is it says um, PSE must plan and execute a fully electrified system um, for existing gas users, which means that at targeted geographically to the cities, the neighborhoods, the streets where they are going to plan and then turn off natural gas to those customers and eventually turn that off to everybody. Part of the problem with that is one, most of us like gas. The other problem is conversion costs of a residence for a business that relies on natural gas for their water heater, their furnace, their utensils, their fireplace. There's not utensils, but their cooking surfaces. Um, the minimum cost to convert a single family home, my organization, I represent residential home builders, they are familiar with these types of things, is probably around $40,000 and more likely upwards of $70,000. There is no sort of help for people to do this in the bill. It's just like you get told you need to convert and you get to convert when they decide you convert. Um, the other part of it is it allows them to get away and be deregulated on the things that they file with the um, Utilities and Transportation Committee C Commission, which is sort of the body that oversees their rates. They, since they are a protected government monopoly, you can't go somewhere else for your service if you're in their service territory. They have to go to the UTC and make a case for what their rates need to be. This bill basically says they de facto get to pick that and all of their clean energy projects and all of their projects, they get to conglomerate their planning, conglomerate their planning, and 
all of the decommissioning of those gas lines is going to be paid by current natural gas users and current electricity users. So we're thinking a rate increase, a utility rate increase, according to their own numbers, between 85% to 117% on utility rates. Again, all of this stuff is on the backs of rate payers. They're going to make a lot of money doing it, and you can't go somewhere else for your power or your heat. So does that explain? Pause, yeah, pause yeah. right there for a moment, because as a, mm -hmm. as a gas user, <laughs> someone who just shelled out a lot of money to replace some def some faulty electrical heat, you know, you know, you, you shell out several thousand dollars for a gas insert. It's it's cleaner. Isn't there? There's already pressure on the electrical grid. Um, how do they? Is there, is there any proposal here on how they're going to expand the electrical grid to handle this? And what's the timeline they're looking at to force people to uh, to abandon all the appliance or uh, whatever it is appliances? How would you describe a natural gas heater or water heater? Um, all these things that they're using in their house that are attached to or that rely on natural gas, um, you know, what would be the, uh, what's their timeline for um, for that replacement or do they have one? But there is no timeline in the bill. So it would require them to go to the UTC and say, okay, we're going to do, we want to tar uh, geographically target this area of our gas system. And they get to pick and choose what areas they go through. So I don't know how they're going to choose that. I don't know if it means sort of income level or people who can fight them, they'll do last or whatever, but um, it is it is not clear as to how much notice they have to give to the individual homeowner or business owner who relies on it. And so if you remember, there's a ton of restaurants who need a flame to do the things that they do to make food delicious to eat. Um, oh. There is no, <laughs> there is no timeline in the bill. It will just be in their sort of future planning um, requirements and they will be allowed to do it how they see fit. So it's really scary. Of, yeah, I didn't even think of the businesses, but of course that makes sense. I mean, all these restaurants are going to use gas heat because the heat's on, it's instant, you know, they're going to be able to use it uh, right away and that's what you need in a restaurant. So you had another burden on, on, uh, on businesses there, um, not to mention the expense I mean, I can't believe I, I've asked you three questions, and I haven't even got to the to the eighty five percent increase in utility costs for people. Uh, and you 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 pointed out, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's there's nothing in there that says how people are supposed to pay for that increase. That they, they recognize that there's an increase. You know, unlike say on cap and trade, they recognize there's an increase going to happen in 2014, and then they pretended that that those studies were lost, and they pretended that nobody's going to have this increase in in uh, the cost of fuel of 44 cents a gallon this past year, and it's all the oil companies' fault. So they they pretend that that they never had these studies that showed that it was going to happen. So they're doing, but on this one, they're saying yes, we know that the the increase on these public utilities is going to go up about you know 85 percent or so. Um, I'm wondering how they expect people to pay for that. Like, I mean, there's a lot of people living paycheck to paycheck. How do you, how, has there been any kind of movement as far as what they expect people to do if those rates go up like that? I, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions in this bill and there's not a lot of solutions, Dave. And I think you pointed out a very good sort of conundrum. This impacts, you know, Jan Heimbaugh is going to be able to afford her utility rates. It doesn't, it, it, I mean, it's going to be annoying and painful and I'm not going to like it. I'll be, I'll be fine. Right. But you're low in. Um, will not be fine. Time. I will not, I will not be fine with that utility increase. I can guarantee but like, that. Yeah. But, but the people who will really have to make some serious life choices between, you know, food and heat are low income residents and um, seniors on fixed incomes and folks on the margins who are just trying to like, you know, maybe save up for a down payment, all those things. Those are, those are the people who are the most impacted immediately by this type of stuff. Um, PSEs by their own admission already 40% of their rate payers are currently rate burdened, which means that 40% of them struggle to pay their bill today. So this will just increase that. And there is again, no solution for relief for rate payers in this bill. In fact, all of the ratepayer protections that currently exist in a utilities requirements to file at the um, Utilities and Transportation Commission are eliminated for this one particular monopoly utility. None of the other utilities who have to do all this get this goodie, none of the rest of them. And the only cost containment measure 
is for PSE's own costs, not for consumer costs. The AG has been be completely absent on this issue for consumer protection. And, um, you know, the sponsors of the bill and the proponents of the bill have been completely silent on what you're going to do about rates when they go through the roof and you put people out of housing and put businesses out of business because they can't afford it. So what went, I mean, first of all, uh, there's a part of me that wonders how something with this um, expansive of, uh, of an issue, uh, how there is not uh, more attention uh, to it. You know, I mean, I feel like this would be worthy of, you know, headlines blaring and news alarms going off with the, with the size of the increases that you're talking about. But I know how it is here. I mean, we saw the similar thing, like I say, with the cap and trade tax, where, you know, Todd releases information. He's using the exact same formula as California uses. You know, they basically invented the cap and trade tax. It's obvious there's, it's it's a clear cut formula. And still there's this kind of, well, the government's, you know, the government officials say that uh, this isn't going to, you know, that this might not happen. But those are the people with a vested interest in trying to minimize the, the potential damage to get what they want. Um, so, you know, one how you know how has the response been what from you know from other media sources you, when you tell them this and from other legislators when you're telling them that you're seeing this kind of, of impact what kind of response do you get and two uh, after that i, I want to get to rule 26 and and why this is even a conversation now because it it seems like it was about to go through and then suddenly they screwed a bunch of things up i don't want to find out how that happened and why but first let's get to what's the general reaction that you're seeing from uh, from media and then from other legislators who might have been borderline or at least giving conversation about uh, about being concerned for you know the average consumer out there struggling with inflation already. Um, okay, so we have been very disappointed in the reaction of the press. I mean, as you know, Dave, you used to be down here. The sort of Olympia press corps is not um, fully stopped, I guess. Um, yeah. and, and one of the lines that has been <laughs> has been said about this is this just um, increases the timeline for PSE to comply with the cap and trade DCA or um, CETA, which is another bill that passed oh a while ago, which is the Clean Energy Transformation Act. However, if that were true, then our Avista utility on the east side, our um, our gas pipeline our system in, in Southwest Washington would also be asking for this. Not, nothing in either of those things about clean energy and decarbonization includes, includes a ban on a, shutting off natural gas. Nowhere does it say that and no other utility is saying this. So a lot, I think a lot of the press has bought the line, well, this just, we have to do this anyways under CCA. We have to do this under anyways under CETA. Um, that is not true, and they haven't done a lot of sort of research. When we have pointed it out, um, we've gotten a little bit of few bites, but not a ton. Um, we've even been told, well, we'll cover this in the cost when it passes. And it's like, well, don't you think like maybe people should know that it might drastically increase their cost to heat and cook food and, you know, live in the house they live in? But it's been largely sort of crickets it's really it's really a shame um and then what was the other question in there That's about if the i could jump in first cricket <laughs> um, yeah go ahead go ahead uh, patrick i was gonna bring uh, in an hopefully i don't get so feedback sure. through your mic no right. you're sounding good okay sounds good um i think the other reason why this kind of escapes attention is for two reasons number one is it was originally a bill in the 2023 session and it died in the senate but then what happens when they start a new session is they resurrect all the dead bills. Um, so a lot of the attention was in the last session and it kind of slipped back into the 2024 session. And then because it's so indirect in how it goes about effectively banning natural gas, is it? it's so technical and complicated that it doesn't get covered as much in the simple way of what it's actually trying to do because you can get lost in the jargon and in the technicalities of it. And especially with the past week of kind of the, uh, the mistakes that they've made in the process that kind of further complicates it even more. Yeah. That was the question I had about those mistakes. I mean, my understanding is that, uh, you know, without the mistakes, this, this thing might, um, might've already passed, 
what you know what was the nature of the mistakes made i think it was rule 26 in the senate you know what what is it that's that's delayed this thing and has uh, everybody taking a second look at the at the as you put it the nicely obscure the conveniently obscured um, natural gas ban. Yeah, so um, everyone put on your sort of nerd hat here. So um, <laughs> this is sort of Not all the time. <laughs> That's right. I never take mine off. Um, <laughs> this has to do with um, the rules of the legislature. So this actually has sort of three different sort of things, right? There's a constitutional issue here, and there's the rule, the rules of the Senate, also included as the rules of the House. They have rules by which they operate. You cannot do this. You have to do this to move a bit to amend a bill. It has to be on something called second reading on final passage. If the bill is on third reading, which is final passage, you can't amend a bill anymore. And so these are these are sort of how you operate. It's a parliamentary procedure and the rules of the legislature. Each chamber has similar rules, but different rules um, on how they operate. Rule 26 in the Senate follows um, and is the same rule as Rule 12F in the House, and is also a constitutional um, provision in our state constitution that says, if you're going to amend the law, a statute, you have to amend that statute you cannot amend by a reference. So what that means is you can't say, I wanna change law A, but I'm not gonna actually open up law A. I'm gonna write law B that says, and oh, by the way, I'm changing all these things over in law A. And the reason for that is because someone who says, hey, what is the law thing to operate by? They look at that law A and they don't even realize they have to go to law B now to see what does and doesn't apply. So, <laughs> so you, if you want to change law A, you need to change law A. You can't amend by reference. Does that, does that make sense? It's a little bit in the weeds and complicated. No, I, I, it actually is. I mean, it's, um, I'm sure it's inside <laughs> baseball for a lot of people, but it makes perfect sense if people are just thinking about it. It's like fine print to a contract. That's not just right. the, you know, uh, yes, you can have cookies and steal my data, fine. You know, it's it's more like, hey, there's a very significant piece here. People need to be able to see that that whole line of reasoning and, and what yep. uh, what possible um, so that their representatives or associations or other, the, the people that they trust to uh, guide them on these things and know what the full implications of the legislation are. There was a similar controversy with Sound Transit back in 2017 or so, although unfortunately, despite you know what sounds like a similar problem, um, the parliamentarians, I guess, weren't as concerned at the time, but this this one, he luckily is uh, back in. So uh, yeah. there's two questions so, that have come so I was gonna, oh, Go ahead. I was gonna say, so I was gonna finish the sort of what happened on the Senate floor. So what this bill does is it amended a bunch of statutes. It put in Section 3 and, oh, PSC doesn't have to do this and they don't have to do this and they have to do this differently, but it's all these other statutes. They're amending these other statutes that they're technically required to plan under, but saying they're exempt from them, but not putting them in the statute. There's a challenge by the Senate Republican, or Senator Short said, I challenge this under Rule 26. Lieutenant Governor is the arbiter of whether rules are violated. He came back and said, quote, unquote, the point of order is well taken. This bill is a hot mess. You need to go back and fix it. They late night drafted an amendment to try to catch all the references, amendment by references, ran it out with like two hours notice of us seeing this new language, not able to process like 11 new pages of law. Um, so what does it do? Um, went to the house, it's in the house right now potentially to be concurred on. We continue to count votes on it, but um, they missed one of the references by amend amendment by reference things in the Senate amendment, because that's what happens when you do things at midnight. And so it's a big sort of, what is the house gonna do question right now? All right, sorry, Dave, go for it. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, very important. So two questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to combine them because they're both related. One's, hey, um, is this one utility being discussed or, uh, or are there others in the state? And what's the possibility of this natural gas restriction moving to investor utilities like Avista or Pacific Power and Light? And you, you touched on this before, but um, this one individual yeah. says it. 
And, 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 and Puget Sound Energy is also an investor owned utility. So those those three are all sort of similarly operated dual fuel. Oh, well, a, a VISTA anyways, they're similar. They all have to go through the same rate planning stuff. DSE has, wants to be exempted from most of these requirements. What's interesting is neither of those other two utilities are asking for this and saying they do not need to do this to meet their targets under CCA or under CETA. Um, a VISTA has, um, last year there was very vocal and active working against this bill. They are concerned what it means for their future because I do think this is sort of, you know, you do it one place and eventually everyone's going to have to do it as well because one, we did it here, let's do it. And also, you know, companies are, their goal is to make money. I don't begrudge that. However, right, when one of the other companies that looks like you is doing stuff that makes them a bigger profit margin, like there is a big temptation there. I don't know. I don't work for Avista. I don't work for Pacific Core. I don't, I don't do that. Um, but I don't know what their sort of prognosis for the future is of wanting to have a similar thing done to them. They have not been supportive of this avenue for this particular IOU, but it's also, you know, the, this is the sort of camel's nose thing of you do it one place and it's going to, it's going to spread. Well, I mean, let's face it, I, I mean, it's hard for people to recognize because on a map, you know, there's big chunks of Washington, you know, the east of the mountains and southwest mountains, but the, the bulk of the population's in the Puget Sound uh, area. And, you know, this is like the the camel's uh, nose, neck, and uh, and hump, you know, <laughs> under the tent, and then the backside's just kind of waiting to go through. So it's uh, it's it's a big, a big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Patrick, if you could address this, I, I thought um, my memory might be a little off, but I thought that this was less a legislative question and more an administrative one, where the uh, the board that's kind of oversees utilities was trying to ban administratively uh, natural gas. Is that a, a separate track and they're trying to do the same thing? Or is this, is this a legislative track trying to fast track what they wanted to do administratively, but were concerned that they wouldn't get away with it legally? Uh, where are we at on that? Well, I think uh, the powers that be uh, would say, por que no los dos. Because um, even this bill, a lot of it is accomplished by um, sort of rulemaking through the UTC. Um, so it's it's technically this um, Bill is even a legislative and a rulemaking option, but we've also um, been dealing with the State Building Code Council trying to um, effectively ban natural gas in the 2021 Energy Code uh, changes, and that's been an ongoing saga. Um, they they tried to do it at first, sort of straight up, make it where um, new buildings and renovated construction could only have electric heat pumps. But um, there was concerns about that violating federal law or preempting federal law. So they came out with amendments uh, to try and achieve the same result without, you know, coming uh, into sort of issues with the federal side of things. And that's when I got involved with the WPC. And I noticed that um, kind of similar to what has happened with 1589, where they make technical mistakes. Uh, I noticed that the small business economic impact statements that they had included in their amendments um, were violating the Regulatory Fairness Act, which is a uh, revised code of Washington, Title 19, Chapter 85, subsection uh, 030 and 040. That basically says that when you make, when an agency is making a rule, they have to do some calculations and consider what the cost of compliance will be for small businesses compared to large businesses. And if it's a disproportionate cost that they need to take steps to mitigate that. And the council, um, basically in their impact statements, they just said, yeah, we did it. We're fine. That's it. Um, when the law is very clear that they have to report certain calculations, they have to show their documentation, they have to show their research. And so I've been uh, leading the WPC's efforts on trying to appeal that and we're actually today going to be filing an appeal to the governor's office over that um we'll have to see if it ends up uh delaying the code or at all it's set to go into effect on march 15th and i know that um 
there's also litigation efforts uh, on similar fronts over this issue. So it's kind of a similar story where both through legislation and through rulemaking, they're trying to push through all these kinds of things and they do it sometimes in a rushed way and they make technical errors. Um, and then they're trying to fix those while still keeping the train moving. I thought, um, and this, you know, for both of you, I, Chan, I, I thought natural gas was actually, uh, you know, a more efficient way to fuel, a uh, more efficient way to get uh, heat to do a lot of the things that uh, are apparently now, you know, the target for, for banning here. When did uh, natural gas become public enemy number one, especially given, you know, alternatives when we don't have the electrical grid that's, you know, there's not this bountiful um, uh, energy out there. We know that there's going to be challenges to our electrical grid already, um, you know, and, and so trying to ban this this fuel source seems like <laughs> a real leap in a strange direction to me. Um, and I, I guess it's one of those things where I don't think a lot of people take it as seriously as as you do because you're seeing it in black and white on on paper because uh, just there's so many people out there that are relying on natural gas and uh, and have important uses for it. Uh, it's a wildly unpopular thing, I would think. Yeah, you know, for a long time, it wasn't that long ago, some of us remember the ads that said, you know, switch to from electric heat to natural gas because it is more efficient and it's cleaner oh. burning. Um, um, you know, so I don't know when it switched, but any sort of carbon, anything is sort of enemy number one of this governor and a number of members of the legislature. And so it's not sort of talking them off of that point is confusing and difficult and difficult to do. Um, it is a more efficient heat source than electricity. It travels better through the lines and you don't, you know, you're not, it's not losing power as it trans like electricity generation loses as it transmits through lines. It's less efficient. It's less effective with natural gas. You get most of your firepower when it's hits your house or your business. And so it is really confusing if we actually want true energy efficiency at some point, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. We talked about energy efficiency, energy efficiency, 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 efficiency. And that has at some point, um, the term has changed. It's not just about efficiency. It's about um, green energy. And so I don't know where they were going to get the power to do this. We regularly, I'm a, I'm a PSE customer. I regularly, even today, got notification of a, another flex event, which I, I think are fine, but it also demonstrates that they don't have the power to power today today's demand how are we going to power tomorrow's demand with an energy source that is reliable the other thing about natural gas um for those of us who have it it's great because when the power goes out i can still cook and i can still take a hot shower and i can still have heat in my house and um when you take that away electricity even wind and solar and i have i have no sort of problem with expanding our energy resources maybe probably shouldn't probably be burning tires for energy but um but other than that like those things when the electric lines go down when there's a windstorm or when there's an issue in the grid they stop being delivered to my house and natural gas doesn't and so what happens like in january when it's 13 degrees outside on the west side here and the power is going out and I still have a fireplace. When when I don't have a fireplace, what happens to me or what happens to people who are relying on that heat source to stay alive because they're senior citizens or they're low income? What happens is, and I have a personal story with this, is they bring in things to their house to stay warm that they shouldn't, including like barbecues and people die from carbon monoxide or they die from cold. So I don't know where the switch happened, but they've changed energy efficiency to greenhouse gas production over everything. And it's the, they 
use the term synonymously now, and they're not. They're very different terms. It sounds like yeah. they've given up the, the, the idea of, um, you know, there, there's opportunity costs, right? I mean, and, and you have trade-offs. You know, so if you if you look at conservation and you have energy efficiency, it's you know you're you're you might still be generating some pollution or or carbon emissions, but that doesn't mean you're not overall better off. And when you look at you bring up some excellent points there about the weather in Washington State. There's entire regions of the state that get extremely cold. If you have power outages, as you point out, that's when you need the heat the most, probably, because it's going to be wintertime, or you're going to need air conditioning the most, because heat can kill as well. Um, right. And, you know, the um, and putting an extra strain on the electrical grid is more likely to cause all kinds of problems, as we've seen in other areas of the country, as, as well as our own now. Um, so, you know, this this is, seems like a really poorly thought out uh, procedure. And I'm wondering, you know, because this was a bill that kind of came up last year and then it was snuck back in this year, how much, how many public hearings have they had on this bill? Uh, you know, maybe I, yeah, I've been very busy with other things. Maybe Todd's mentioned it before that I missed it. But how many public hearings have they had on this bill? And did, did they give it a, a lot of time? Well, they couldn't have given it too much time because there were so many screw ups in the way it was written. <laughs> so, so we know that. But um, I think what, that's. One of the problems is they they did have a public hearing for it, but um, so they brought up the technical issues with it last Thursday. They drafted a, a striker amendment overnight, and then they submitted it on Friday with a couple hours of notice. But it didn't just have technical fixes. It had policy changes as well, and that yes. did not get a hearing. So it doesn't really matter how many hearings they held before because they're not going to have any hearings uh, now that they've introduced new policy changes um so that yeah. and then going, um going back to sort of the cost benefit analyses one of the reasons that heat pumps isn't always more efficient is that they can have higher maintenance costs and they don't always last as long as uh, natural gas um, heating and so like with the building code council what they did to get the cost benefit analyses to come out how they want it to is they include the social cost of carbon, which they basically just use to penalize um, fossil fuel emitting heat source. Because when you take out the social cost of carbon, heat pumps aren't more efficient than natural gas heating options. Um, and so, and they do have a requirement to do that, I think, through the OFM, but that's how they get the cost benefit analyses to show what they want. But the problem with the cap and trade system, the Climate Commitment Act, is that actualizes those costs. So you don't need to add in an extra social cost of carbon because we already have the cost of carbon added uh, added to the, the infrastructure through the Climate Commitment Act. And, and the other problem with these prescriptive changes, that this is, I have to say this because uh, Todd always brings this up, is one of the benefits of a cap and trade system is you don't need all these prescriptive changes. It's going to accomplish the... the um, the overall reductions that you want anyways. And then it gives people flexibility to figure out how to best to meet those, those restrictions. But they're on top of the, the climate commitment act, they're doing these prescriptive changes, forcing people to uh, into certain paths for compliance that aren't necessary because the cap and trade will uh, control the overall emissions anyways. Right. Uh, a couple more questions come up. Tanya see, says, seems to me the cost of compliance will be a burden, not just to business, but to every family with natural gas in their homes. She's outraged. Chad says, does the 85% increase in utility rates pertain to impacts on electrical rates for all PSC customers? And does the 85% include the 40,000 plus cost to convert to electric or is that separate? Jan? So um, the, the sneaky little thing um, that's in this bill is right now uh investor owned utility has to file a rate case for people for their natural gas rates and their electric rates and those are separate rate filings and approvals that they can do all this paperwork what this bill is combines those two rate cases so they can say we can use to pay for our natural gas conversion our electric rates and vice versa we can use our natural gas rates to pay for some of the electric stuff so everybody's rates are going to go up even if you don't get natural gas service from PSC, because they don't all serve everywhere natural gas. If you get electricity from them, your rates are going to go up to pay for 
this conversion across their system. And it allows them to file one rate case for these two different services, which is different than they've ever had to do it. And the reason they're supposed to do them separately is because it's supposed to be a rate payer consumer protection. The other question there is those rates, the 85 to 117% rate increase does not include any cost to convert. That's just your rates that are going to go up so that they can pay for their future decommissioning and conversion to an all electric system when they choose to do it, where they choose to do it, as they choose to do it. Your conversion costs for changing your house over to say an induction cooktop um, or a heat pump. And heat pumps can be great, but they also only like cool and heat about 20 degrees in your house. So if it's really cold, they're not going to get you much higher than, you know, what you need to be and really hot. They don't get you lower. So like they have a, maybe a 40 degree window, higher or lower from where you are. To, but, but that doesn't need a heat pump um, because in probably putting additional load into your house for electricity. So you're probably going to need to pay for a new transformer up the road that PSE will make you pay for. Or you know your neighborhood pay for for repaving your streets because you've done underground utilities work or extra line work. You have to probably get a new panel and upgrade a panel in your house to bear the additional load of all this stuff. Heat pumps, mini splits, all this stuff adds up, and that is not part of the rate increase. The rate increase is just the rate increase. That yeah. is amazing. Going back Good. to uh, Tanya's or Tanya's question. Um, the the specific small business economic impact statements that I was talking about, that is very specifically dealing with the cost of compliance. So like if businesses have to hire extra staff or they have training or they need extra services or supplies in order to comply with the, the rule changes. And the irony there is that uh, just to, to complete an impact statement, they first have to do preliminary calculations to determine if they need to do one. And the building code council did do that and they determined that there is going to be costs. So they need to perform a study, but then, uh, but then they say, oh, there's no costs. So it's like, well, how do your pre your preliminary calculations say there's going to be a cost. And then your final result says there is no cost. That doesn't make sense. There's still the separate side of the, the total impact and cost of the rules. So cost of compliance aside, there's still the increased cost of construction that's going to happen for for new homes and renovated homes um and and commercial construction as well with the the new energy codes that are going to go into effect uh this month and then that's separate from uh hb 1589 which uh will even sooner force people to upgrade their homes than it would be if they needed to wait to renovate and so that's going to be you know, we're already dealing with the housing crisis. And so they, they always talk about what we need to do to make housing cheaper and more affordable. But at the same time, they're pursuing these other policy changes that increase the cost of housing for people. So I was about to say that hasn't even been mentioned. Just, you know, it's, it's hard enough to afford skyrocketing rent, rent, skyrocketing mortgages, skyrocketing property taxes, and then skyrocketing utility rates. And that's even before the the new construction costs, which I'm sure would uh, this would add to that as well, um, or or it just adds to the overall price of a converted home because people are going to want to get that value out of their home as well. So you know, talk about making things less affordable. You asked how they how they came up with that number. If they said that um, that you know they had a cost initially, and then at the end they decided there was no cost. I think it's whoever whoever does the receipts at retail stores now or grocery stores, you know, how it says at the end, it says you've saved $170, even though you just shelled out $300 at the at, at the store. Whoever's doing that is uh, is the one calculating the savings here. Um, Kirk has a great question, Jan. Um, if the bill passes the House, is there another avenue for repealing? And basically, we can we can kind of summarize that into you know what what's the status of this bill now, and who holds the the keys to power over it? Right. So right now, the house is sitting, and it's in the house. It could go at any time on the house floor for what they call concurrence vote, and then the final passage because both chambers have to pass the bill in the exact same form. Right now, we do believe it has been identified. You know, amendment by stat amendment by reference issue 
It depends on if the House says we're not going to concur with the Senate amendments because we need to fix that issue. Then we're kind of stuck. There potentially is litigation options. Um, the second thing is that they say um, we do need to, you know, we're we're just going to we're just going to run it as is, even with that little issue. It's potentially a constitutional issue. Then there's, you know, a litigation, a easier litigation option there. It would not get rid of the whole bill, but it would get rid of the, the, the section that it's in is sort of the biggest problematic section for ratepayers and conversion costs. So, but that, you know, is a timely and expensive exercise as well. Um, and again, this is a billion dollar company. That's my dad, lawyers who are, yeah, out the wazoo as well. So there are potential avenues, it just gets a lot harder. And also yeah. engage, yeah. engagement at the um, UTC is also possible. They do take public comment. It's really complicated and complex, wonky stuff. But um, organizations like mine will probably be investing in representation there as well. The UTC, let's uh, go straight yep. to the jar. Uh, what, what's that stand for again? Utilities the, what? The Utilities and Transportation Commission. Yeah. yeah. So um, so that's the overseer, the over, overlords of of that's utilities. Right. Yeah. Um, any final words before we uh, wrap this up? This is again, we've been talking about House Bill 1589 and the, uh, the backdoor attempts to ban natural gas and the consequences uh, that it will have on uh, and require uh, from people who have natural gas in their business or homes in terms of, of conversion. Um, and then also the additional costs uh, to the utilities and uh, the additional strain on the grid. Um, any any final words? Let's start with Patrick, and then I'll let you conclude, Jan. Yeah, well, I'll, you know, say uh, thanks for having me on. It's been great. Um, I, I guess I'll focus on the government accountability side. When they don't do things right, and when they make these little technical errors, it almost inevitably involves in legal challenges. And so, the the costs of the policy aside, it also by making these errors and trying to rush the process. It increases the cost of the state. They have to pay for litigation. They've had to allocate uh, half a million dollars to the Building Code Council to deal with litigation. And I imagine if they pass 1589, the state will have to pay for uh, lawyer services to to try and protect that bill, too. So, um, you know, it's important that they try to follow the process and do things right um, because it saves you money in the long run. Um, and trying to rush things is just bad for accountability. It's bad for transparency, the the policy concerns aside. So that's kind of the last message I'll have on that. I will say we have, <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but before you get your final word, I wanted to make sure I have this right and my notes here. 85% increase uh, to utility costs is your estimation there? 85 yeah. to probably 117, and that's based on filings that the PSC has done at the you know, um, Utilities and Transportation Committee. And, you know, and that's just, that does not include the conversion cost. Correct. And the conversion cost you estimated for, you know, uh, for um, what, average household or, or average your, customer? Your, 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 average, your average, yeah, your average natural gas single-family house. Now, multifamily is different and businesses are different as well. I think for restaurant conversions, probably $300,000. But um, for a home, we estimate minimum 40 grand, probably more like 55 to 70 grand. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I just want <laughs> yeah. to make sure we more of this out there as far as uh, letting people know. This is probably one of the more impactful bills we've talked about this session. And I want to give people a chance when we get this up on YouTube today to share this information with as many people as possible. And I'll, and I'll try and get a, uh, uh, a, a, a 30 second version up as well. Jane, you want to give us your final words? Yeah, I would say, look, this bill hasn't passed both chambers in, in either form yet. There is still an opportunity to weigh in on behalf of ratepayers, particularly low income and senior citizens who have budgets, right? They're not making, can't go out and just get a part time job. If you call the legislative hotline and be asked to be connected to your state representative and tell them to vote no on 1589, that is incredibly helpful. 
and like you need to do it today and tomorrow and Thursday because we will be here until this bill either passes or dies on Thursday and then like, Okay, Jan Heimbaugh with the Building Industry Association of Washington, Managing Director of External Affairs. Thanks so much for being our first uh, outside organization guest on Washington Policy on the Go. You know, I I'm very honored. You know, thanks everyone. I meant to have you on before, but uh, you know, it worked out well today with uh, Todd out of town, and he said you've you've got to hear this. So I said, well, let's let's do it. And and Patrick, uh, thanks for your work as well on this uh, really an outstanding and fascinating examination of the issue today. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you next week for Washington Policy on the Go. See you next Tuesday at 1215.